Good evening. Our campus community is thrilled to welcome you to Dominican University of California to learn this evening from our special guest, Michael Beschloss. I'm Nicola Pitchford, acting president of Dominican University. This leadership lecture series is a program of Dominican's Institute for Leadership Studies, a leadership development center guiding students and professionals to become better leaders and team players. The Leadership Lecture Series is a partnership with Book Passage to engage students, the campus, and the community in socially relevant conversations. This fall, we're celebrating 15 years of the Leadership Lecture Series, highlighting inspired acts of leadership across the disciplines by, in those 15 years, over 126 world-class authors. Our partner, Book Passage, is, as you probably know, much more than a bookstore. It's a community center and a community treasure. Uh, our thanks go to Elaine and Bill Petricelli, owners of Book Passage, for their vision and their commitment to building our community and its intellectual life. For the past nine years, our lead sponsor of this leadership lecture series has been Private Ocean, which is one of the oldest and largest privately held wealth management firms in Marin. Private Ocean has been named seven times by Worth Magazine as one of the top 100 registered investment advisors nationwide. It's a two-time recipient of the prestigious Schwab Impact Award and it's been named the best wealth management firm by North Bay Biz. And so on behalf of the university, I'd like to thank Private Ocean for their generous ongoing support of the Leadership Lecture Series. And joining us this evening to introduce the evening's speaker from Private Ocean is Justin Dutre, advisor and principal of Private Ocean Wealth Management. Please join me in welcoming Justin Dutre. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Welcome to Dominican. I am privileged to welcome our guest this evening, author and American historian Michael Beschloss. Michael is a specialist in the United States presidency and best-selling author of nine books, including New York Times bestsellers, Presidents of War and the Conquerors. Michael is a native of Illinois and attended Williams College and Harvard University, where he majored in political science and earned an MBA, respectively. He is the NBC News Presidential Historian and a frequent commentator on PBS NewsHour. He received a 2005 News and Documentary Emmy Award for the Discovery Channel's Decisions That Shook the World and has received six honorary doctorates. Michael is a trustee of the Weiss House Historical Association and the National Archives Foundation, and he also sits on the board of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. And you can also find him on Twitter, at, at BeschlossDC, which time listed as one of the best Twitter feeds of 2013. Tonight, Michael will discuss his recent book, Presidents of War. With 10 years of research and writing, Michael offers an intimate look at a procession of our leaders as they seized more power, taking the country into conflicts. Presidents of War combines the sense of being there within the context of two centuries of American history. What would the founders think of current events? Please join me in welcoming to Dominican University our honored guest, Michael Beschloss. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, I love being here. I love being at Dominican. I love Book Passage. I think all of you do, do too. Can we say thank you to Elaine? Where is Elaine? I, I would not want to live in a country without Elaine. I think you all feel the same way that, that I do. And, and Justin, thank you so much for that really nice introduction. Uh, I was talking a little bit earlier. I, can I augment it for a minute or two? And, and I should say, you've all taken a horrible risk because I've taken 10 years writing this book. It's 750 page long, pages long. You know, who knows how long this speech can be tonight, so uh, <laughs> if you feel the need to, to leave before I'm done, I will totally understand. Uh, but uh, the way I got into this line of work, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, was uh, 
I come from Illinois, and you should completely distrust anything I say about democracy because I grew up in the Chicago of the old Mayor Daley, which I don't think any political scientist would regard as anything even remotely approaching a democracy. Uh, and what I remember from my childhood, there was, I think, the tax assessor went to prison. And there were a lot of county officials in Cook County who went to prison. And as I remember, he was, I think, on the steps of the prison, and there was a group of reporters, and he was all manacled, and they said, you know, don't you think this is the time for you to confess what you did wrong? You know, you've been convicted, you're, you're beginning to serve your sentence. And he said, you know, I just can't confess what I did wrong. They told me it was bribery, but I always felt like a barber just accepting a tip. <laughs> so that was sort of what Chicago was like. And the other thing was, the old mayor, Daley, uh, in, I think it was 1976, he was being asked for a comment by reporters in his office, fifth floor of City Hall, about an interview that Jimmy Carter had given to Playboy magazine. Few of you might remember, lust in his heart and all this. And it almost cost Carter the election because he was relying on southern states and a lot of southern voters did not think this was very funny. So for the first time, he and Gerald Ford were almost tied. Now, old Mayor Daley could have cared less about who was going to win the presidential election. He was just worried about his local ticket and knew that if the president is doing badly of your party, presidential candidate could you know, weigh down your, your own choices for aldermen and so forth. So anyway, the uh, reporters for City Hall were asking Daley, what do you think of Carter's Playboy interview? And he keeps on saying no comment. And he finally tried to dis distract the reporters by taking out a picture of himself taken the previous week. He had caught this enormous fish in Lake Michigan, and to, to catch any fish at all in Lake Michigan in 1976 was a miracle because it was very polluted. So finally, the reporters see this, and one of them says, all right, Mr. Mayor, what did the fish think of Carter's Playboy interview? <laughs> and Daly couldn't resist this. He said, well, the fish told me that if he had kept his mouth shut, he wouldn't have gotten caught. So I always thought that the, the credo for the democratic machine in Chicago should be, keep your mouth shut, you won't get caught. And that was a credo that the old mayor Daley observed uh, all the time. Uh, anyone, one more item about my distant past and then I'll talk a little bit about the book. Uh, I had Republican parents, I grew up in Chicago. When I was four years old, I was taken to the side of a Richard Nixon motorcade down an expressway outside of Chicago. And I don't remember this, but I was told that I was held up in the air. And that was the fall that Nixon was saying, elect me and your children will not grow up under communism. And so Nixon was elected years later. I was not a communist, so that was maybe the only campaign promise made that fall that was actually <laughs> kept. And later on, I had lunch with Nixon at the end of his life. I was interviewing him for something I was writing. And I told him what I thought he would find this charming story. And he didn't find it charming at all. He fell dead silent. And he asked something like, what do you think of Boris Yeltsin? He changed the subject. And so I didn't know what gross infraction I had committed in the middle of this lunch. But I got home, and I called a friend who knew Nixon. I said, can you find out what I did? He called back, he said, here are the three things you did wrong. Number one, Nixon is interested in the present, not the past. Number two, if he was interested in the past, it would not be 1960, the election he lost. Number three, if he was really interested in the past in 1960, the place he would like to discuss would not be Cook County, Illinois, <laughs> uh, where he feels the election was stolen from him. So I don't think that suggests any lesson, but, uh, I got my start as a presidential historian, as a theater prop in a Richard Nixon motorcade, so go figure. <laughs> Discount anything I'm about to say. <laughs> anyway, I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, this long book I've just written and published. And what it really is about is presidential power. And it's a book I started in 2007, so it was not a response to the time that we're living through, but at least in my own case, I feel intensely some of the issues in it more than I would have had this book come out 10 years ago. And what it's really about is the fact that 
The founders of our country were really worried when they created the office of President of the United States and were writing the Constitution that presidents of the United States would become like British kings or European dictators. They would become all powerful. Maybe that was in the nature of leaders. And they knew that British kings, when they became unpopular, one of the, the ways that they tried to restore their popularity was to fabricate reasons for war. And you had a war, even though it was unnecessary, and everyone would unite suddenly and love the king who was there to defend them. And the, the founders were worried that American presidents would suffer from the same problem, that in the future, you'd be in the danger of American presidents drawing the nation into un unnecessary wars. And so as a result, when they wrote the Constitution, they said, let's give the war power not to the president, but to Congress. And they thought that they had fixed it. And one of the founders that felt the most strongly, at least at the time of Philadelphia, about uh, avoiding unnecessary wars was James Madison. That was 1787. But in the first, actually the prologue of my book, you know, I advanced the clock to August of, 19, of, of 1814. What happened then? Great student, Dominican student here, August of 1814, extra credit. The British came in and burned the Capitol and the White House. So I have this scene, Dolly Madison has fled. James Madison flees because he's worried that the British marauders are about to take the White House and hang him. They would have loved to have him as a battle trophy, the same thing with his wife. So these scenes as the Capitol is burning down and the Brits are about to torch the White House, the President and the First Lady are running through the dark forests of, of Virginia at night with the rain falling. They didn't know where each other was. They were looking for each other in the wilderness. And Madison was on this galloping horse, and he was, he was trying to get ahead of the British, who we thought could arrive at any time and kill him. But he kept on getting off of his horse and turning around to see this otherworldly scene of the city of Washington, with he, which he, he had had so much to do with building, disappearing in a swirl of hellfire. He was mesmerized, he couldn't take his eyes away from this. And so what was happening here? Madison was escaping the British, but something was happening, I think, that was more profound, which is Madison, who had felt so strongly in Philadelphia about no unnecessary wars, he was the one two years earlier who had taken us into the War of 1812. And do you mind a little audience interaction? Is that okay? Uh, not mandatory. Uh, what was the most unpopular war in American history? Not Vietnam. War of 1812. And uh, and that is and that is something that you know sometimes we don't think about, but the poignancy that the president to break the constitutional restriction against unnecessary wars of all people is James Madison, the one in Philadelphia who felt so strongly. And so Madison got us involved in the War of 1812. And, and one more question, if you don't mind this, and I won't do this ad nauseum. What was the first war in American history that we lost? It was not Vietnam, it was the War of 1812 because we had two war aims. One of the, them was stop the Brits from harassing our ships. The other one of them was seize British Canada. And we achieved neither war aim. I'm particularly glad we didn't achieve number two because I think Canada is great as it is. Uh, so we fought this fairly costly war that went on for two years, ended in defeat. We didn't get anything that we had particularly been fighting for, yet, Madison and his, they didn't call them spinners in those days, but that's who they were. They managed to sell this as a great victory in American history, largely based on the folklore. Star Spangled Banner, you know, Fort McHenry, uh, Don't Give Up the Ship, Old Ironsides, you know, all the, you know, Andrew Jackson at New Orleans. Any war with all these glorious scenes couldn't possibly be a defeat, but it was. And they even branded this war, they called it the second war for independence, which really takes some doing. I mean, we were completely independent and we were not exactly in danger of the Brits 
arriving on the East Coast to invade and take our independence away, but they were trying to find a reason that we had fought this war other than these two other goals that we failed to achieve. So what does it matter that they managed to spin and convert a defeat into what seemed like a victory? What mattered was this. When we Americans wage a war that really is a defeat or was fought for the wrong purposes and later generations think that this was a great thing, it encourages later presidents to get us into further wars that could turn out to be tragedies. And this happened uh, James Polk. James Polk, when he became president, he was carrying a cane. And it turns out that the cane was emblazoned with glorious scenes of the War of 1812, which he was too young to participate in. And so he assumed that 1812 was just a moment of American glory that was just begging to be repeated. So Polk becomes president, and he fabricates a fake incident on the Texas border provoking a few Mexicans to attack some American troops. There's a border skirmish, and then Polk goes to Congress and says, in retaliation for this terrible offense against the United States, we need a major war against Mexico. We need to occupy Mexico all the way down to Mexico City in a war that might take two years. Little inordinate, even if the skirmish happened, which it really didn't. But the fact is that the reason why Madison fabricated this incident was he had an ulterior motive that he never told to Congress and never confided to really almost anyone, and that is he wanted to seize almost a, a million square miles of territory from the Mexicans, New Mexico, California, other places, and add it to the United States. Perfect example of ends versus means. We're always historians evaluating presidents in terms of not only what they were trying to do, but whether the way they did it was corrupt. And you can think that it was a good thing that America would become a coast-to-coast -coast nation, which I do, but Madison did it in a way that was corrupt. He was a liar, and he was a cheat, and he was a bully. And I have some less nice things to say about him as well. But Madison has got these, you know, the thing is that he not only did these things, you know, lied to Congress over and over again, lied to his Secretary of State, he kept a diary in which he's boasting about this all the time, saying, you know, aren't I great? I, I lied to uh, the majority leader of the Senate today, isn't he a fool? Uh, and so the result is that Madison got his war, conquered Mexico, did get his land, but there was one young congressman who knew that this should not have happened. And this young congressman rises on the floor of the House in late 1847, and he says, essentially, I think this so-called attack was really a fake. I wish President Polk would show me the spot where the Mexicans supposedly attacked. And for saying this, and you find this a lot in American history, this congressman was vilified at home would have had a very hard time getting reelected, and the name of the young congressman was Abraham Lincoln. And to Lincoln's great credit, he had the courage to rise up against this war that was unjustified, in which the president had lied to Congress. And also Lincoln wrote at the same time in a letter to one of his friends, he said, I think morally, no one president should ever have the right to take America into war. And he was absolutely right, and it showed Lincoln's greatness even early on. So you advance the clock about 13 years. Lincoln is the president who's dealing with the secession of the South from the Union. And, you know, for about the first year, we remember Lincoln as a great stylist and a great orator. In most cases, you wouldn't say that about most of the things he said during his first year because Lincoln began by trying to say this was a war, almost a legalistic war, to reunite North, North and South under the Constitution. And he knew in his mind that this was really a moral struggle against the evil of slavery, but he didn't want to say it. He was finding his voice. And it's only after about the first year that Lincoln really begins to talk about the Civil War, not in these legalistic terms, but as a great struggle between good and evil, and it's sort of like the moment in The Wizard of Oz where it goes from black and white to color, 
you know, Lincoln really does find his voice and begins talking to Union families about why they should be willing to tolerate giving up the young soldiers in their families, and he, he begins to find his voice. And it's the best example that I can think of of why a president of the United States who finds himself waging war always has to do it on a moral plane. Anything less than that, that's not in our democratic tradition. And other qualities about Lincoln, too. He was enormously sensitive, as we know. He had enormous empathy. He was always worried that the decisions that he was making that sent young men off to their deaths, that he would get too disconnected from them. And well into the war, there were so many people dying that there had to be a national cemetery built. And Lincoln said, build the cemetery near my summer house, the house where I go with my family for about four months each summer, because I want it to be the case that every time I drive up, I'm taken in my horse and carriage up to the house, I want to see the fresh graves being dug, dug of young Union soldiers. It'll be very painful to me, but I want always to be reminded almost every day of the consequences of the terrible decisions that he was making. He suffered deeply from depression. He said uh, to one of his friends, can you believe that I, who cannot stand to even watch a chicken being slaughtered, I'm responsible for these oceans of blood and all these hundreds of thousands of young Americans killed? That's what you want in an American war leader, someone who has, has that kind of empathy and suffers, and oh, how did Lincoln suffer? Uh, there was a young major in the Civil War who was called William McKinley. It was one of the educational moments of his life. He admired Lincoln, but I don't think he learned enough from Lincoln because everyone remember the way we got into the Spanish-American War, 1898. There was a ship, an uh, American ship, sunk in Havana Harbor, and the tabloids and many in Congress said, we've got to go into a big war against Spain because the Spanish sunk our ship. Well, as it turns out, the ship was sunk actually by a boiler accident, but you can't get involved in wars against boilers, so they got us involved in a war against Spain. And the result of the struggle was that we were in a war that led to uh, seizure of the Philippines, change of government in Cuba, which was a good thing, seizure of Guam, uh, Puerto Rico. The United States became a world power for the first time. But yet again, you had a president going to Congress and asking for a war for reasons that were false and really fabricated, and a really bad example for later presidents. Uh, just to sort of spin through the other presidents that I write about, Woodrow Wilson, uh, I am not a fan. Uh, is there any Wilson descendant in the audience? Uh, you might want to leave before I talk about Wilson. Uh, or or send a contribution to the Woodrow Wilson Anti-Defamation League. Uh, I'm all for Wilson's first term. He was a great champion of pro progressive reform, and for me, that's about where it ends. Uh, Wilson ran for president in 1916. He narrowly won. The reason he won was the votes of, narrow vote of voters here in California. 1916, women could vote. The vote was not guaranteed, which it was by an amendment, of course, four years later. But women in California and a couple of other states could vote, and they re-elected Wilson by this very narrow margin. And do you know why they voted for Wilson? Uh, what was Wil I'm sorry to make this such a quiz. This is pathological. Uh, <laughs> what was Wilson's slogan in 1916? Kept us out of war. Kept us out of war. Total lie. A, uh, he didn't keep us out of war. We were at war with Mexico briefly during Wilson's first term, so that was false. The buzzer should go off. Number two, if you run for re-election with a slogan, he kept us out of war, doesn't it sort of imply that you're going to do so in your second term as well? Uh, which people thought. And Wilson, we know now, knew that we were very likely to get involved in World War II, or World War I, really just a few days after he took office again if he was elected. So 
Wilson, who preens himself on this great moral stature and the books he wrote about American history, was sort of lying like many other presidents and shouldn't have done so. Uh, so Wilson uh, is reelected by votes of women, and they were women voters because primitive polling of the time shows that the women who voted for Wilson voted for him because they wanted peace and they thought that Wilson was the candidate most likely to bring it to America. And it's poignant to me because they were taken for a ride and they should not have voted for, voted for Wilson. And as a result, Wilson becomes president again, takes the United States into war. And if you're looking for things you want from Woodrow Wilson, you're sure not gonna get advanced views on race because his views on race were atrocious and disgusting. Uh, they were primitive, he was not a person of his time. In his time, he was extreme and fringe in his racism. He threw African Americans out of the federal government. He was the president who screened Birth of a Nation, that peon to the Ku Klux Klan at the White House. Warren Harding, who followed him, Taft and T.R., who preceded him, were all much more advanced in their racial views. And the other thing is that, you know, the thing you think you'll at least get from Wilson is that when he gets us into war, he will be explaining to Americans why their sons are dying in Europe. And for the first year of that war, he's at this kingly remove, sequestered in the White House, feels that he's sort of above having to explain why all these people are dying. So people were mystified. I should mention, by the way, I sent my Wilson chapters of this book off to a friend who, famous historian who's a great Wilson fan and was deeply chagrined and tried to argue me out of some of this without much result. But one of the comments I remember he wrote in my margin was, would you at least be open to deleting the words messianic and conceited? So you could see which way I was <laughs> going, uh, which I don't think I did delete as it turns out. But anyway, you know, just in terms of being a competent politician, Wilson doesn't do much to explain the war. And then at the end of the war, which was 100 years ago, next month, we're almost up to the centennial, amazing example of mission creep. This war that he entered for fairly limited reasons, suddenly he says, well, you didn't know it, but this was a war to end all wars, a world war to make the world safe for democracy. He had done almost nothing to prepare Americans for these grandiose aims. Plus, in the midterm elections of 1918, exactly 100 years ago, he said, this election is about me. So help me. Uh, uh, Donald Trump doesn't know who Woodrow Wilson was, but Wilson, Woodrow Wilson <laughs> foreshadowed Donald Trump. Uh, it was sort of an early version of I alone can fix it. Uh, and you know what Americans did? They, by both houses, they voted the Democrats out of office because they were so disgusted by what Wilson had said. They felt it was immodest, uh, and they also felt that a president should not be, be making a, an appeal like that. That was true in 1918, I think it's also true in 2018, but that's another story. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was for a League of Nations, a peace organization that would make sure that there would never be another world war. Totally admirable. How did he go about it? Well, I alone can fix it. There was a peace conference in Paris. Wilson said, I with my great talents, messianic and conceited as he was, uh, I'm indispensable, I've got to go to Paris to be the one to negotiate this treaty. So he went. He was out of this country for months, never happened before. And just, you know, elementary logic, when the president leaves, and there are a lot of people who hate the idea of a League of Nations, guess who's gonna dominate the dialogue when you were gone? Henry Cabot Lodge, who hated the idea of a Le League of Nations, all sorts of other senators. So by the time that Wilson got back to the United States in the summer of 1919, League of Nations was a lost cause because he had not been here to advocate for. Had there been a League of Nations, had he been modest enough to withhold his services from the Paris Conference and instead do something a lot more important, which was campaign for the League back home, America would have been part of the League. You could have avoided the rise of Hitler. You probably could have 
forestalled World War II, at least a World War II, which was as tragic and dangerous as it was. I'll skip through a few more presidents and then questions. Am I okay on time, Elaine? No, I'm right here. Okay. <laughs> Elaine is going to give me the hook if I go for too long, so I'll try to make this relatively brief. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt got his start under Woodrow Wilson as Woodrow Wilson's Assistant Secretary of the Navy. So once a, you, again, you've got a president who is going to be the president of the next war, whose experience began during the previous one. And his experience with Wilson was basically spending a lot of time talking to his cousin, Theodore Roosevelt, who was still alive, who hated Woodrow Wilson. And they would get together all the time in private and say all the things that Woodrow Wilson was doing wrong. And that's a good thing because when FDR became the president who had to deal with the largest war and the most essential war in our history, he had really been through it all before because World War I was largely a naval war. And he had seen where Wilson had failed and he was very determined to avoid those mistakes. And I basically see Roosevelt as a very effective president, a model in, those, in most respects with two monumental exceptions, and they're so monumental I shouldn't even refer to them as exceptions, which suggests that I don't think that they're important. Number one, FDR, who generally had been pretty good on civil liberties, he's the president who interns Japanese Americans. Even though J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI is telling him it's not necessary for our own security, and even more than that, even though his wife Eleanor tells him not to do it. Uh, and she says to him essentially, you know, Franklin, if you intern the Japanese, it's going to tell me that we share political principles less than I think we do. And one of the stories in this book is that almost all these presidents have very strong women at their sides who save them from catastrophe oftentimes. And Eleanor Roosevelt is an example of that. She writes these wonderful letters, for instance. She writes a letter to a friend in about 1935. One sentence from it tells you so much about their marriage. She writes, more and more I think that Franklin is a great man, but he treats me like a stranger. That was the mid-1930s, and her whole thing was, their intimate relationship was gone, but she felt that she shared his ideals so she could remain at his side. And so he interns the Japanese, and friends of Eleanor say that their relationship never recovered what she saw as that betrayal, that he would do that knowing how she felt, and he did it one day without even giving her warning that it was going to happen. And two years later, Eleanor Roosevelt has been demanding to visit the camps because she thinks rightly that the camps are not as benign as, as the government is saying that they are. And she finally gets permission to go to a camp in Arizona, which was probably the nicest of the camps that were there. And she made a point with photographers of having herself photographed with reporters present. She asked for a glass of milk. She takes a sip and she says, it's sour. And she asks about other conditions in the camp which people had not done up into that time. A wonderful moral force at Franklin Roosevelt's side. And then the other thing, of course, is the Holocaust, which I think that Roosevelt did not do enough to thwart. So, you know, you're always finding these presidents with both good and bad. Harry Truman, one of my heroes, usually uh, gets to Korea, which is what I write about, uh, I don't find him so heroic. Particularly because when the S South Korea is invaded by the North, Truman wants to send in troops under MacArthur, fine, I'm all for that, you know, uni uni United Nations state uh, in danger. But his aides say to him, of course, Mr. President, you're gonna go to Congress and ask for a declaration of war the way the, con the Constitution says, and Truman says, uh, I'm not going to do that. I don't have to go to Congress. James K. Polk defied Congress. Why don't I? All these historical precedents create real problems. And so he does not go to Congress. And his aides ask him, why do you feel so strongly? And he says, I'm worried because there will be an acrimonious debate. I might be embarrassed. And plus, in five months, I have 
midterms. So presidents do bad things for political reasons. Uh, advancing the clock, do I have time for one more President Elaine? Okay. Right, uh, Lyndon Johnson, anyone heard of him? Uh, LBJ, I've had this intense relationship with about 20 years. I did these books uh, on LBJ's tapes. You know, he taped about 700 hours of his private conversations. But for this book, I listened to about maybe 250 hours that I hadn't heard before, that had not been opened before. They were the last to be opened. And the thing with Johnson is, uh, this is a president who in many ways was such a great man, Medicare, civil rights, but he did just about the worst thing that I can think of a president doing, the most immoral and the most evil. And that is that he sent young Americans off to war under false pretenses. There's one tape that really makes the point. There's a moment in 1965, February, where it's just the point he's sending young men, mainly men, off to war, but some women. Uh, and in public, he's sending these idealistic young kids off to fight. And many of them are going to die, and he knows it, or be maimed. And at the airport, he sees them off and says, we always win the wars that we fight. And then he goes in private, and he calls his defense secretary, Robert McNamara, who I find one of the villains of American history for all sorts of reasons. And he says to McNamara about the war, he says, Johnson says, I can't think of anything worse than losing the Vietnam War, and I do not see any way that we can win. This is not 1968, this is 1965, basically the first month that the Vietnam War begins to escalate. And so I thought, you know, maybe this is just a moment of discouragement, and I listened to more tapes and in private, and this is a, a refrain. He does not think this war is going to be won, yet he's sending off hundreds of thousands of American youth to die. I can think of a lot of bad things a president can do. I cannot think of anything as bad as that. It was immoral. He, used, he deserved to be impeached for it. Uh, and having said that, I tell the story of the war. He becomes more paranoid. Uh, he infringes on civil liberties. He abuses the FBI. He abuses the IRS has the tax returns of anti-war reporters investigated. He asked the CIA director, Richard Helms, to go find evidence that the reason why the campuses are aflame is because the students are all paid off by communists. Uh, he gets FBI, uh, the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, to, to give him evidence that, fake evidence, that the reason why anti-war senators are against the war is because Chinese communists are stuffing cash into their pockets. You know, A, in 1966, there were not terribly many Chinese communists running around Washington with cash to stuff in the pockets of, sen of senators. And the worst thing of all is, you know, Benjamin Franklin said, your critic is your friend. Well, LBJ did not think your critic was your friend by a long shot. He would sick the FBI on you and he would sick, sick the IRS. And it shows something that I think is a very important lesson that is a very germane right now, and that is that if you are worried about a president who's going to infringe on democracy, the fastest way that he can do that is to get the United States involved in an unnecessary war. Because the times that our democratic freedoms have been most infringed upon during the whole of American history have been at wartime. It's exactly what the founders were talking about. They were worried that war presidents would, take, would become dictators and take our freedoms away. Woodrow Wilson championed them something called the Ep Espionage Act, which meant that journalists cannot write against a president who is at war. And that is used today by President Trump to go after journalists and go after leakers. Did anyone on your iPhone happen to get something called the presidential alert announcement? <laughs> well, the first one wasn't too bad, but if we are in wartime and you have a president who does not respect democracy, you're going to get messages from your president that are not so benign. Presidents in wartime can declare martial law. You know, there are presidential emergency exercises, for instance, and one of them is president goes to an un underground cavern and declare martial law. 
So all I'm saying is to bring this full circle back to the founders. The founders were right. Wars should be war uh, rare. They should only be fought when they are absolutely necessary. And they also should be fought not by presidents overnight single-handedly, which you saw with Harry Truman and LBJ following in his footsteps. It should only be done by presidents going to Congress asking for a declaration of war and an honest debate on how long the war is going to take, what are the reasons, how many kids might be killed. And we haven't had a war declaration or a president asking for one since the year 1942. And that shows how much we are in danger of the day, and I hope it never comes, when a president who feels that for political reasons it is to his benefit to take the United States into an unnecessary war, maybe even, God forbid, after a fabricated terrorist incident. The lesson of the founders is that we must always be vigilant to protect our de democratic freedoms and in no way more than the danger of presence leading us into war. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And aside from that, everyone have a great evening. Uh, uh, I think Elaine has some questions. Uh, I, I do have questions. But first, I, have, uh, I would like to congratulate you. Not only did we learn a lot tonight, and it's this an incredible book, but it's just out last week, and it, within days, hit the New York Times bestseller list at number three. So, And you can see why, can't you? Um, I have a question here about Richard Nixon. Uh, can't, can't someone wait. wants to know about his attitude about war. Well, that's, that's a great example. Uh, and I tell a little bit about Nixon in the Vietnam War, and some of this is known about Nixon's tampering with the election of 1968. I mean, for those few who maybe don't know the story, uh, LBJ was going to declare a bombing halt on Halloween 1968. And Nixon was worried that this would help Humphrey become elected Johnson's vice president. And so Johnson unveils the bombing halt and says it will lead to peace talks. And so there were cutouts between Nixon and the South Vietnamese government that persuaded the South Vietnamese not to attend the peace talks. And that led voters to go back to Nixon because they thought that the peace talks were collapsing. Uh, and LBJ on his t tapes calls Nixon up and says, you know, Dick, this is treason. And it was treason. It was a president stopping, or a candidate for president stopping a real chance for peace for his own selfish political purposes. And it led to an interesting dynamic because not only was a possible chance for peace lost, and not only was Nixon elected to office under false pretenses, because a lot of voters in 1968 listened to Nixon say, you know, I have a plan for peace. They, many of those voters, so the polls tell us, assumed that Nixon would be more dovish than Humphrey. So they voted against Humphrey, who we now know would have ended the war almost instantly. And they voted for Nixon, who basically took on LBJ's approach to the war and kept this war going for another four years, tens of thousands of more Americans killed, and got a settlement that wasn't very different from what he could have gotten in January of 1969. Given what I write about, I cannot tell you over the last 20 years how many family members I've met of people who died in Vietnam who asked, did my son, or in some cases daughter, die in vain? And it's a very, th it's a very hard question to answer. So in any case, that's Nixon, and during the next three years, this odd dynamic that's a vestige of what happened just before the election of 1968, which is Johnson thinks that he can blackmail Nixon by revealing in public and necessary, if necessary, that Nixon committed treason. Nixon thinks that he can blackmail Johnson by revealing that Johnson abused the FBI by using it to wiretap his associates and possibly him. 
And I have a scene in the book that comes from the reminiscence of one of Johnson's friends who told me this, that in about 1972, rumors that Johnson had abused the FBI to eavesdrop on Nixon and his people got back to Johnson. So Johnson is trying to get his story straight and he calls up his F the, F the guy who was his FBI uh, liaison in the White House and Johnson asks him in a leading way, you know, I never used the FBI against Nixon when I was president, did I? And, and the guy says, well, I'm afraid, Mr. President, you did. And Johnson's only reply was, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so much of your research has, uh, you always find the things nobody else can ever find. Try hard, thank you. <laughs> but uh, part of it is because um, some people taped things and also... J. Edgar Hoover turned out to be a great friend of the historian in <laughs> dropping on so many hotel rooms. Um, this question, yes, uh, it looks, seems a hopeful question. Do you think they're taping now? Uh, uh, <laughs> President Trump has threatened, uh, or ha has at least suggested in some of his tweets that he, for instance, taped the Comey meeting. And apparently he did do this quite a lot uh, before he was president. So far, I guess the champion tapers in the White House would be that great successor to Dean Acheson, Omarosa, uh, uh, yes. and some of the other figures around. Uh, he'd be crazy if he did, because if you have a tape like that or a piece of paper, it usually comes out. It's either leaked or it's subpoenaed. Which brings me, may I speak for a moment about Brett Kavanaugh? Would you please? A uh, little bit less of a non sequitur than maybe it seems, because one of the things I write about the book is relationships between presidents and the Supreme Court in wartime. And one of the things is you see some real violations because, as you know, the founders wanted there to be big distance between Supreme Court justices and presidents so that the Supreme Court could make decisions that were independent. This was breached in history that I write about in a couple of ways, you know, a couple I'll mention. Uh, 1952, Harry Truman was in the war in Korea, wanted to seize the steel mills. There was a steel strike, and he knew that this was illegal. So he called up uh, the Chief Justice of the United States, who happened to be someone who he had not only appointed, named Fred Vinson, but also his poker buddy. They played poker every weekend and talked about everything that was coming before the Supreme Court. Total gross violation. And so he calls up Vincent and says, you know, Fred, I'm thinking of seizing the steel mills. How do you think the justices would vote on this? I mean, the founders' bodies were spinning so fast in hearing this. And Vincent says, go ahead, no one up here at the court minds. So Truman did it, and as it turns out, the justices did mind, and they overruled Truman, and they told him that he, was, he had done the wrong thing. But the point is he never should have been talking to Vincent. And it's a problem for our democracy when you have breaches like that. LBJ was even worse. Uh, he appointed to the court in 1965 his very close friend whose name was Abe Fortas, who did his taxes and knew where all of his bodies were buried. And LBJ thought that there was no reason why the fact that someone was on the Supreme Court should stop him from calling on Fortas to write speeches for him, choose Vietnam bombing targets, and also uh, sort of similar to Fred Vinson, you know, he'd say, well, I've got a bill that I'm writing, and if I write it this way, is it more likely to not be overruled by the Supreme Court, or should I include other kinds of language? You know, that was modern times, and it was a terrible thing that happened. You may see where I'm leading. Uh, Brett Kavanaugh, fifth member of a conservative majority. Uh, Donald Trump won the election. I mean, I'll make an argument about the stolen seat, but that's for another evening. He was appointing a justice, uh, and he chose the justice on the list that the Federalist Society had written that he had agreed to choose from if you had to look for the one justice with the most extreme and permissive view about presidential power. You put that in a computer, out pops Brett Kavanaugh. He wrote a famous article, 2009 Minnesota Law Review, that says that presidents may not be subpoenaed, perhaps. 
They may not be investigated, they may not be indicted, they can use pardons to help themselves. Finally, another potential justice with views as extreme as that. From my point of view, it's quite clear why Trump wanted Kavanaugh appointed, even when Kavanaugh got into big trouble that might have caused another president to find another nominee. So you've got now Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court, the choice of a president who is extremely adept at telling you that you were indebted to him, and a justice who spent about 10 days closeted at the White House with Donald Trump's political handlers who were asking him, tell us all of your damaging secrets so that in case those come up during the hearings, we can help protect you. So you've got a justice on the Supreme Court who is on the record as being very permissive toward a president, whose secrets are presumably known by the president concerned, and Donald Trump is the one who uses the word blackmail all the time, and there's a very big likelihood that maybe in the next year, and maybe even sooner than that, a case will come before the court that has to do with the court, whether or not the court rules against some uh, something that Donald Trump does that many people would find a violation of the constraints normally on presidential power. Compare that to what I see as one of the great moments in American history, summer of 1974. U.S. versus Nixon came to the court. You know, should Nixon's tapes be re released or not? It's eight to nothing. One Nixon appointed justice recuses himself, w William Rehnquist, the others vote against Nixon. I'm not sure that's going to happen this time. And our doc democracy may depend on it. Uh, I don't know if we have to ask the question, is there any chance of stopping the increasing concentration of presidential power and the executive having all the power? Well, if, if, if the Supreme Court is, as I have said, we should sleep with one eye open tonight because we're in a more dangerous society than we were even six months ago with, with Andy, Anthony Kennedy in that seat. I wish I could say something that's more comforting, but that really is the way I feel. And the other thing is that, you know, the brilliant system of the founders, I mean, this is obvious, it depends on these three branches in constant conflict. And what we're seeing is the shutting down of the conflict, which may lead to the shutting down of our democracy unless we all as citizens act. I mean, I've said why the Supreme Court may more and more be unable to exercise independent judgment against a president of the United States who who, who cuts corners and crosses lines. Uh, at the moment, tonight, we've got the President's party owning both houses of Congress, and the leaders of Congress in the context of American history are really more lapdog than I have ever seen. This is not normal. It's not normal for Mitch McConnell to behave in the way he is. It is not normal for Paul Ryan to behave so often in as servile a manner as he seems to do, biting his tongue all the time. I don't want to speculate why they're behaving this way, but it is ahistorical. Compare this to the time of LBJ. LBJ had, for instance, a majority leader, Democratic majority leader, whose name was Mike Mansfield of Montana. He was the majority leader, and he was a huge critic of the Vietnam War. He hated that war. And he went down and met with Johnson at least once a week and said, you've got to get out of this war. This is the wrong war for us to be fighting. I think it's immoral. I think that you know, your strategy is wrong. You know, that's what you usually see in American history, even a Senate leader of your own par party realizing that the act of patriotism is not to bite your tongue and be a lapdog. It is to constantly criticize the behavior of the president because that will make him a better president. So I'm really worried that if you've got a chastened Congress, a chastened Supreme Court, and a president who is grabbing for power in al by almost any means necessary, I think it is tremendously dangerous. Uh, the happy side of this is that what American history shows is that when we've had moments like that, uh, voters in election make a difference, and also sometimes people behave in a way that you don't expect. For instance, at the time that the Nixon case came to the court, 
there were a lot of people who were saying at the time, this is going to be resolved in favor of Nixon because he chose four of these justices. Nixon himself, cynical as he was, thought that there was a good chance he'd win the case because, as he said in private, those people owe me. Well, they didn't feel that they did owe him, and I just hope to God that if a case like this comes to the Supreme Court, that even Brett Kavanaugh will make himself a profile in courage. Would that that were true. <laughs> I hope so. And that uh, takes our, me to... Our, our lips to God's ear. Yes. Uh, what advice would you have for those of us in the audience who are deeply troubled by the character of this current president? Well, I'd advise be deeply troubled because it's, it's genuine. Uh, I mean, you know, I wanted to talk about history tonight, but, you know, let's talk about this in terms of war. This is a president who during the last campaign more than once said, I love war, and I know more than the generals. And this is a president who in 2011 and 2012 tweeted repeatedly predicting that Barack Obama this is almost verbatim what he said, we'll start a war to get reelected president. It was not true, and he knew it, but it's a dangerous thing to have a president who in his mind is connecting those two ideas, waging a war that kills young Americans and getting elected president or upping your poll ratings. President Trump has also said, the great presidents in history of those are those who've waged major wars. So all I'm saying is that, you know, we're, we've got a real problem because there was a reason why the founders tried to make it so that presidents could not get us into war single-handedly. And, you know, inevitably, you know, I'm not saying if the Russian missiles come over the North Pole that in those 15 minutes a president should go to Congress and have a debate before responding. Obviously, that's an essential part of a terrible part of modern times or... Same thing with a terrorist incident or cyber warfare. But what I'm saying is that we've got an office in which horrible power has been concentrated on one man. It goes back to what, remember what I was saying, what Lincoln said, 1847? It's immoral for one man to be able to take the United States to war. That's what's happened. And that's why, you know, I mean, again, I don't want to unsettle you, but I don't think this is a new idea for anyone here who is troubled by President Trump's character. If you're worried about the war power, and if you're worried about the you know, enormous authority that's been invested in a president, then think very carefully about the character of the person who has that job. There's a very interesting question here uh, that's kind of dear to my heart. Someone is saying that we seem to be geographically divided rather than being one country, and that the way uh, some things in our Constitution, such as the Electoral College, are set up, it changes where the loyalties are. I don't know if we were always that in that much trouble over this, or whether this is new, but this person wants to know, what do we do now? Is there anything to do? About the Electoral College? Uh, well, he mentions the Electoral College, and another person mentions the way geography separates us instead of bringing us together. All those things are true, but it was always true. And we've been, you know, anyone who says we're more divided now than we ever were in American history is totally ridiculous. Uh, anyone heard of 1859 slavery? You know, that's my definition of divided. Uh, and you had people clubbing each other on the Senate floor, which probably is a practice that will soon resume the way things are going. Uh, <laughs> But, or 1940, uh, this, this nation was divided right down the middle over, you know, do you go to war against Adolf Hitler? Uh, there were senators who were saying, if you reelect Fra Franklin Roosevelt, this is the language that was used, he will plow under every fourth American boy. That was an intense debate. Now, this country is divided over some pretty big issues, but they don't come anywhere near those. What we're lacking in 2018 that we did have in 1859 or at least 1860 and uh, 1940 is what we're lacking is a president who recognizes that every president of the United States except for the current one realized that a big part of his job is to unite this country. It goes all the way back to George Washington. It's democratic tradition. This is a country that's divided in all sorts of ways 
just as Elaine has said, geographically, national origin, you know, people have different ideas, and every single previous president has, has felt that it was a sacred part of his responsibility, where possible, to do things that would bind the nation together. Even Richard Nixon, probably the most divisive president of modern times, uh, God, this trivial question uh, quiz is getting out of control. Anyone remembered what his slogan, his inaugural slogan was in 1969? Bring us together. Bring us together, excellent. <laughs> Dominican alum? <laughs> uh, alum in spirit. Uh, that's it. You know, even Nixon at least gave some lip service to that. But uh, President Trump, even in peacetime, I can't think of more than two sentences he's spoken with that aim rather than pitting groups against one another. And it's another case, we've, got too pre you know, we've gotten too dependent on presidents doing things like that. And so now we're going to go out and we're going to vote uh, and hope our votes are counted. Uh, but in, in Chicago, uh, when I was growing up, we were encouraged to vote more than once on election day. So we, <laughs> we, we always felt that we had a special responsibility. <laughs> well, we, we'll, we'll try to get counted okay. once. Maybe, uh, maybe not. Michael Beschloss, thank you for your wisdom for the 10 years you spent you. writing this um, incredible book. I know that all of you have a book. I hope you'll think about who you're giving this book to another book to you keep this one and get at least five more because then your christmas shopping is way, done for every way, thinker you, you know I'll, I'll bet you elaine has used this line uh if if there's an author you like you always say buy 10 copies read it 10 times uh, yeah, but i've never <laughs> used that I, i'm not saying it for myself i'm saying for other authors that you like <laughs> no you only have to read it once really okay. but you will love reading it and uh i just you are a national and international treasure, and we are so honored you came Thank to you. us. Thank you all Thank for you. coming very much. That was wonderful. Thank you, Matthew.